poetics. In other words, contemporary avant-garde poetry is not really a symptom of late capital saturation, as Jameson suggests. Rather, its defenders argue, such linguistically ambitious literature constitutes a critique of capitalism. In both its form, and if you've read Perlman's poems, they're very, they're very paratactic, so they're hard to consume, and there's this kind of Brecht, Brechtian V effect. He's trying to alienate the reader in obvious kinds of ways. Um, so people who want to argue for it say that this is a critique, right? There, there's a paratactic, there's this V effect, and the content of it is, is also hard to commodify. Even the most successful poetry, avant-garde or otherwise, is a hardly a meaningful niche on the spreadsheets of multinational capital. Again, trying to lay out the, the defense here. Charles Bernstein nicely sums up this skeptical response to Jameson's discussion um, this way. He says, the same artistic, this is Bernstein, the same artistic critique has a radically different meaning depending on where and when it's used. Juxtaposition of logically unconnected sentences or sentence fragments can be used to theatricalize the limits of conventional narrative development, to suggest the impossibility of communication, to represent speech, or as part of a, uh, a mosaic constituting a newly emergent or traditional but neglected meaning formation. These uses, have, these uses need to have nothing in common. Nor is the little known painter who uses a neo-Hellenic motif in her work necessarily doing something comparable to the architect who incorporates Greek columns into a multi-million dollar downtown office tower. But it's just this type of mishmashing that is a negative horizon of those discussions of postmodernism, i.e. Jameson's, that attempt to describe it in unitary socioeconomic terms. Like many poets and critics who respond to cultural studies work on economics and poetics, Bernstein here tries to highlight what we might call a certain semi-autonomy for the literary, insisting, in fact, that the poet's work, like the cultural production of her friend, a little-known painter, in fact, cannot be discussed in the same vocabulary as multi-million dollar downtown skyscrapers, at least not without mangling the work of poetry by wrenching it into a foreign idiom and context. However, it's just this critical move, harnessing literature as the other to the dictates of late capitalism, that I want to wonder about after postmodernism, after the linguistic turn. If everything is modeled on language or the mediating works of language, then paratactic interruption has a crucial job to do, interrupting the too hasty conclusions and too easy consensuses of totalization, um, which is that thing to be avoided at all costs in the world of postmodern literary and cultural theory. But if the binary pairs of fragmentation and totalization, meaning and chiasmus, one could multiply them endlessly, are no longer the structuring tropes of post-postmodern life, how to reposition the literary away from its now unfortunately comfortable deconstructive posture as the subordinated, supposedly subversive term in any opposition. The literary, the literary as the constant reminder of meaning's impossibility, its inability to be totalized. I'd like to suggest it doesn't help much to follow Bernstein's path of critique here and isolate one of Jameson's postmodern cultural modes, avant-garde poetry, video art, painting, architecture, the novel, in order to suggest that he's gotten its connection to socioeconomic phenomena wrong that X phenomenon resists late capitalism rather than merely being a symptom of it. Because I think that's to make the very modernist mistake that Jameson's essay suggests is no longer available to us. Everything does, in fact, exist on the same flat plane or surface of culture. Or as Jameson provocatively puts it, quote, postmodernism is what you have when the modernization process is complete and nature is gone for good. Culture has become second nature. If, as everyone in the theory game seemingly agrees, there is no transhistorical human nature somehow existing outside the world or contemporary capitalism, then the question necessarily becomes, how are these modes of cultural production related? How do they configure a kind of odd, open totality? What one might call in another lingo a poem. And how could one kind of cultural production or process usefully overcode another? Insofar as what these formations mean, I think is of as little relevance for contemporary poetics as it is for economics or cultural studies. What, we may want to ask, can poetics tell us about the work of economics and culture rather than vice versa? What roles can literature play other than the other, right? the useless, the, um, the questioner? To take that question and make it into a statement, I'm trying to suggest that socioeconomic questions of culture can quite fruitfully be explored by deploying the tools and languages of poetics, so skilled at the creation of discontinuous open holes, at seemingly unrelated cultural and economic formations, rather than strictly the other way around, deploying the cultural and economic theory at the literature, which tends to yield not much more than the tautological conclusion that, like everything else, contemporary literary production bears a trace of the economic system from which it's produced. In short, if poetics wants to have any substantial traction in contemporary debates about culture, literature may in fact have to be discussed 
in the same socioeconomic terms as downtown office towers, museum art, or hip hotels. With the important caveat that literature being discussed in these terms doesn't mean literature being determined by them. In fact, the practices of international banking or the real estate markets are these days becoming more overcoated by the languages of poetics than the other way around. As many of us learned painfully in recent years, even the value of your home is a performative rather than a constative entity. Well, it's not objective. It's, you know, it doesn't exist, really. Um, so this historical situation should, if nothing else, give new life and important new directionality to the post-postmodern debate between literature and culture. Baldly stated, it seems to me that the general line of reasoning concerning the uselessness or semi-autonomy of literature, literature as the other to the dictates of the contemporary world, is all but exhausted at this point in our economic and cultural history. And not so much because we're all inexorably forced to work through the omnivorous, omnivorous leveling logic of the market, which is defensible position, it seems to me, but because the notion of aesthetic semi-autonomy implied by this kind of argument is more of a hindrance than it is a help in harnessing the singular critical potential of poetics in the contemporary world. Which is to suggest that what remains culturally singular and potentially critical about literature at this historical juncture is not some negative notion of its contentlessness, its inexorable frustration of totalized meaning. Literature is something like Adorno's non-commodity par excellence. Rather, the equipmental force of literature at this point, at this historical juncture, may precisely lie in its intensifying and expanding our sense of the poetic or the literary as a robust form of cultural analysis or engagement, whose force is enabled not by its distance from dominant culture, but its imbrication with contemporary socioeconomic forces. Within such a rethinking, even literature's seeming uselessness might be recoded from a stoic prophylactic avoidance to a positive, maybe even joyful form of critical engagement with contemporary biopolitical and economic life. Uh, section three, two powers and false. There's a section I'm cutting out here on Delilah, who I think is the great spokesman for the negative notion of literature. Um, um, reading mostly Mao Tzu and other things, we can talk about that. I'm just going to move on to this other section. So section three, two powers of the false. Rather than seeing literature, literature's power emerging primarily through its status as the bearer of old truths, even if they're essentially negative modernist or postmodernist verities concerning the falseness of all totalizing truth claims, one might focus more directly on literature's powers of the false, its post-postmodern abilities to create other virtual worlds. The phrase powers of the false is most immediately associated with Gilles Deleuze's use of it as the title of chapter six in his Cinema II, The Time Image. There Deleuze presents the time image as a direct mode of manipulating time, a general maneuver we've been calling post-postmodernism, right? Direct access rather than mediated access. In contradistinction to the montage-laden movement image, what he calls the movement image, and its necessarily mediated relationship to temporality. Um, in its insistence on mediation, the movement image is then more symptomatically postmodern in the terms I'm using, although uh, that's not a terminology Deleuze uses. Um, and that the time image would be more directly post-postmodern. It's direct access and usage. <clears throat> As Deleuze explains, time images are, quote, direct presentations of time. We no longer have an indirect image of time which derives from movement, but a direct time image from which movement derives. We no longer have a chronological time which can be overturned by movements which are contingently abnormal. We have a chronic non-chronological time which produces movements necessarily abnormal, essentially false. For example, one sees this first mediating or critical power of the false on display in ideology critique, um, which is that power of the false which unmasks the exclusions or the illegitimacy of a certain kind of totalizing truth by showing it to be beholden to multiple un unacknowledged other points of view. Um, think of the montage as the most intense form of the image movement or the movement image, the extension and contraction of chronological time in something like Eisenstein's uh, Odessa step sequence. Right? You show the same event from many different points of view. Um, and that's the movement image, is it shows truth always to be, to be mediated by positions or by people. In contra contradistinction, this second or direct or what Deleuze calls non-chronological power of the false works not through mediation by the true, which is to say by interrupting the true, deconstructing it, questioning it, showing it to be beholden to multiple points of view, but gives another account of the real altogether one that's beyond the current regimes of true and false, right? It gives you a new way to articulate the difference between true and false, rather than suggesting what you think was true is false. Um, and here Deleuze draws his examples mostly from American film noir, which is clearly not driven by movements that reestablish norms or that question truths, 
but by the navigation of virtual worlds created by packs of falsehoods, right? Everyone's lying to everyone in these films. Um, likewise, Deleuze leans very heavily on Orson Welles' final film, F is for Fake, um, which is a, I think, a really great film, which equates whatever creative power cinema possesses, not with being true to an auteur's individual vision, but with the collective powers of error and the false, right? That, that what makes us interested in watching film is not its truth content, but its ability to spin out things, whole worlds for us to consider. To articulate the same point somewhat differently, one of the primary things falsified by the second power of the false, um, the, the more direct power of the false, is the idea that art or language primarily strives and then fails to be true. In fact, Deleuze's work on language with Guattari constitutes a decisive swerve around the despotic nature of signification or representation <laughs> altogether. The idea that language, for example, is primarily made for communicating truth or meaning, right? This is the content of their critique. Um, they insist on the, quote, unimportance of the question, what does it mean? Interpretation is our modern way of believing and being pious, Deleuze and Guattari write, because signification is consistently territorialized on tautological questions about meaning, truth, and absence. Because every signifier fails adequately to represent its signified, attesting to the absence of the signified or the absence of meaning, then every interpretation always already lacks. It inevitably fails to do justice to the thing at hand. Such an assured interpretive failure and its symmetrically inverse flip side, the postmodern infinity of interpretation, inexorably defines meanings and subjects not in terms of what they can do, but in terms of what they can't do. They can't be complete. They can't be true. They can't be whole. They can't be objective. However, such a subverting discourse is also oddly totalizing or despotic because each and every term in the field shares the same fate, an unfulfilled destiny doled out by the central logic of the signifier. This weak power of the false, represented most succinctly by the logic of the signifier, performs the relentless work of the negative, always and everywhere hollowing out the true. Right? There are then, Deleuze and Guattari write, great differences between linguistics of flow and linguistics of the signifier insofar as the linguistics of the signifier remains territorialized on questions of representation, on the question, what does it mean, rather than on axiomatic determinations of force or command, on the question, what does it do, what is it good for, what can you use it for. For Deleuze and Guattari, quote, language no longer signifies something that must be believed, it rather indicates what is going to be done. No problem of meaning, but only of usage. As they argue in Thousand Plateaus, the elementary unit of language, the statement is the order word. Rather than common sense, a faculty for the centralization of information, we must define a faculty consisting in emitting, receiving, and transmitting order words. Right? The language moves things around. It makes things happen. It doesn't primarily mean or fa especially fail to mean. Which is to say that languages may be treated better as a direct form of interpolation than it is as a mediating form of interpretation, information, or signification. Right? It's a more post-postmodern understanding of language. Language directly commands and configures. And hence, it is not treated productively as the trace of an absent or future meaning. In short, Deleuze and Guattari teach us that language is not primarily meant for interpretation, but for obedience, resistance, and usage. Writing has nothing to do with signifying, they write. It has to do with surveying, mapping, even realms that are yet to come. One might say that the performative in Deleuze doesn't succeed by failing to be objective or a constative. Rather, it succeeds the old-fashioned way, as a direct deployment of force as a provocation it makes something happen. The cash value of truth or representation is always beholden to a prior deployment of force, the power of the false as the production of the new rather than as the interruption of the same. I think those are the sort of two powers of the false, right? The, the false can produce whole new worlds or it can, you know, or it can falsify the truth. Right? It can either undermine things or it can create things. Those of us who lived and worked through the years of big theory in academia know all about this weak, weak or in 